And I'm going to hand over directly to Mickey. Thank you. In the break, I discovered that the other workshop has cats buttons, which I think is totally unfair. Um, I'm grateful for all of you to come back despite the cat but buttons. And I'm sure that afterwards we can all go and grab cat buttons because everyone should have some. Um, so yeah, I hope you enjoyed your, your coffee break. Uh, we'd like to dive a little bit more into practicality, how to actually use it. Um, so in this section, we will talk a little bit about premise conformance and about repository interoperability first. So about conformance, we learned this morning that like Leo said, premise is really open, it's really flexible, but with anything you need to have some kind of guideline. It's so difficult if everything is open and flexible that makes everything possible and you don't know where to start. And a lot of people felt that, so in 2015, uh, the premise editorial committee introduced the premise conformance statement to give some guidance of how to go forward with uh, implementing a minimal set and how to kind of gauge what level of premise interoperability and conformance you're at. The baseline requirements of the conformance statement are really straightforward. They say, and we already mentioned that this morning, that for every, every implemented level of entity, so if you implement object, events, rights, and agents, if you implement all of them, it's true for all of them, the mandatory semantic units must be captured. So if you don't have rights and agents, just objects and, well, just objects, let's say that example, then you only have to implement the mandatory ones for objects. If you have objects, events, and agents, you would have to include the mandatory semantic units for those entities. And we will look into that in detail in a minute. There are two other requirements which are fairly straightforward, I think. The one thing is if something has a shared name, it automatically is assumed that it has a shared definition. So if you call something by the same name as it is called in the um, data dictionary, like identifier, for example, we assume that you mean an identifier and you don't mean, um, let's say, an, what, what would be something else than an identifier? You don't mean a name by it or um, a descriptor of some kind. The other thing is you, can, you don't have to have shared names, right? It's totally legitimate to have an identifier, but within your repository, you don't call it identifier, but you either use your own, your natural language. So in German, we would call it, for example, Eindeutiger uh, Identifikator or Bezeichner, or you call it um, Islandora ID or Object ID, as we saw in one of the earlier slides. That can still be an identifier, but you need to document that that is the identifier somewhere. So those are the baseline requirements. The conformance statement in general is broken down into two different groups and three different levels. Um, so the groups are, the easiest thing to do would be to go for level A or group A or stage A, which says that you just implement the object entity. You just use the premise data dictionary to capture information about the object. Level B would extend that to object, event, and agent. We'll get in a second into why rights are not on there. So those are the two different groups that you can go for. And then within each group, there's three levels. So the higher the level, the higher the sophistication, or sophistication is maybe the wrong word, the higher the, the literal approach to implementing premises. So level one is just mapping, which we heard this morning as a use case. You already have a lot of metadata and you want to ensure that that is actually premise metadata. So what you do is you look at your own metadata schema that you have, your own semantic units, and you map that to premise semantic units. That is a total conformant way of implementing premise. Now, if you want to take it, take it a step further, you implement export mechanisms based on that. It can be automatically, so fully automated two processes or like click a button or several tools in a chain, but what you have to do is showcase that your internal metadata can be exported into premise. So not just documented, but actually exported to something that is called the same thing as the premise semantic unit. 
And then the third level, the full level, is to have premise implemented as an internal metadata schema. So you actually call everything by the same name as it's called in the data dictionary. Um, through that, you don't need to export anymore and you don't really need the mapping anymore because the mapping naturally is the data dictionary. So those are the different levels of conformance there are. It's not as strict as a checklist that you can use for conformance, like trustworthy repository certification. It's more of a framework to operate in and to give you guidance as to how you can move forward with implementing premise in a conformant way. So some examples of what is conformant and what isn't. What we see on the top right is a screenshot from the data dictionary for object identifier. We've used object identifier frequently today. So what we can see here, um, highlighted in yellow, is uh, M for mandatory. So if you say you use premise, we just learned the minimum that you have to do is say you use premise for your objects. And then the next thing you have to do is look at what uh, semantic units in the data dictionary are mandatory for object. And in this case, the mandatory thing is object identifier. And R for repeatable, so the Islandora example or the migration example that we heard about this morning, you can have many uh, containers of object identifier. And then it's broken down into two information pieces. The one is the identifier type, which could be something like handle or DOI or UUID or the Islandora UUID. And the second one is the value, which is actually the identifier in itself. So if we look at the uh, examples there, um, it's conformant to capture it in all the things with the check marks. So you could um, call a DUI instead of object identifier and just document somewhere that your DUI is uh, your object identifier and that the type is DUI. Um, same thing for Eindeutiger Bezeichner, which would be the German language version of unique ID. Um, you could capture it in Dublin Core, call it DC identifier here, repeat it. Um, and you could have it as a full like literal premise implementation, which is the last example on the bottom, where you actually have it broken down into the different semantic units. And there's two things on there that aren't conformant. The first one would be to not have none, to not have it at all, because we just learned that it's mandatory, so to not have it is naturally not conformant. And the second thing would be to call it object identifier, but that to have it contain something else, in this case, it will be um, a PUIT for a file format. And that Yes, it is some form of identifier, but it's an identifier of a file format, not an identifier of the object. So those will be two examples of what is not conformant. Everything else is totally doable. Is that clear here? Are there any questions around that? Okay, cool. So which entities should you implement? We just learned that there's two levels, level A and level B. The object is the core entity. You can't really have preservation metadata without saying about your digital object. After all, it's what the whole fuss is about, right? You're doing this to preserve that object, so naturally, it's the first thing you need to implement. Event and agent are grouped together because they're closely related. You can't really have an event without an, an, an agent. If you describe that something was done, you should always describe who did it, right? Um, that's true for migration with what to for uh, access, accessioning, for example, who took this on, for rights, who granted you right, and so forth. Um, so implementing agents has strong implications. It means that the repository is able to manage and follow the use of its agents and objects in its life cycle. Again, coming back to the example that we heard this morning from the Tate, where we talked about the example of capturing metadata either prior uh, to ingest, to know what was done to an object when it was displayed or when it was shelved, when you liaison with the artist, it's very important to know what was done with it and who did that and also with what rights possibly. But the rights entity is currently excluded from the conformance statement. It does help a repository to track intellectual property rights. Um, we did talk about that this morning. Also uh, about institutional policy to, to some degree. But uh, it's really complex and as we also learned, it's evolving. So in a future version of the conformance statement, there might be room to include rights in that framework, but it's currently not included, so you don't have to implement it to achieve level B. 
So what are some of the use cases that you can use Premise for, aside from the natural of documenting your digital objects? You can use it to build other standards. So it's a basis with uh, locally defined elements. For example, the Netherlands Institute for Sound and Vision, and Mary Lane is here, she's still here, uh, can showcase or talk how uh, they used their um, preservation metadata dictionary built around premise and extended that um, to build their own standard. There's the link here to look at the full-fledged documentation, and Mary Lane is here, so if you're interested in how premise is used for AV preservation, talk to her, she's an absolute expert on this. It can also be used as a free source of inspiration. So the data exchange protocol for interoperability and preservation, which is an ISO standard, also lean heavily on premise. So like we said this morning, um, premise is essentially a collection of best practice around preservation metadata about what information pieces you need to maintain your information alive and well for the long term. So you can use it as that as a form of inspiration, but also as kind of like a jumping board to build your own standards around. The second use case is a self-assessment tool. Again, it goes back to the fact that Premise describes best practice and core preservation metadata. So if you want to know whether you're today able to provide information about your digital ad, uh, aspects to ensure that they're preservable and that they're understandable in the future, I'd like to invite you to just go through the data dictionary as a checklist and to see, do I have that information somewhere? Do I already capture that? Do I already capture fixity? Do I already capture what algorithm was used for fixity? Um, do I capture rights and so forth? So you can really use it as an easier self-assessment tool than repository certification to ensure that you're capturing the information that you ought to be capturing. And lastly, and this also comes back to the beginning, it can be used as an export format, um, pref uh, preferably in a premise ex uh, endorsed expression, so XML or RDF, but it could be JSON as well, it could be anything. Um, but if you call it the same way as the semantic units in the data dictionary, this goes back to the example slide that I had when I invited you to look at four people in the room and imagine that you want to exchange information about your identifier with them. It's very frequently used for that. And I think as we're moving into an age of sustainability, we think more about interoperability of different systems among each other. The migration example is such an example as well. We keep on migrating to a new system, of course, to from Content DM to Islandora or to a new uh, archival solution. Then we really need to think that we can export that information very easily into something that can be understood by other, by other systems. So that is one of the key use cases that actually exists for premise. So this just reiterates a little bit what we already heard this morning. The last use case is that it can be used as a native format um, within the repository data management module. So the question is where do you store your premise data? It's something that you want to actually be able to query to manage your data over the long term. There's so much value in being able to go in your archive and just have enter one query and to find out how many objects you have, for example, of file format PDF A1B or of MP3 or whatnot. So all that is metadata that is described in the data dictionary and it's essential for data management. It's not just data that you gather once during ingest and it's nice to have and you never do anything with it, but it's essential data to plan preservation management, to plan preservation watch, um, and also to, to possibly pass out to your users and to cross-check if they still have the tools that are required to access that information. Like we said many times, any technology uh, using a premise endorsed expression or not can be used. You can capture the premise information in Excel spreadsheets and CSV files and XML databases. RDF to triple stores or pretty much anything. Um, so that will be very well within any conformance level. Conformance level three would just say that you would have to have that in a premise native uh, descriptor of the semantic unit. So what does that look like? Um, to use a different example, we've been through identifier so many times, we feel that you know well, maybe we should use fixity as an example. Um, the top example uh, shows how a fixity value is used in an RDF implementation, how it's captured. Um, the bottom level would be uh, a native XML one. So the top one is a 
XML serialization of RDF. So those are just two uh, valid implementations to capture fixity. The next one will be in a spreadsheet um, or in a CSV. So again, the same thing. You could just have it in a flat TXT file or in something that is open as an Excel spreadsheet. And again, that is perfectly premise conformant. In this case, you would need to document how it's mapped because um, the algorithm and digest are not called the same thing. And that is it for different use cases around premise. And now we're going into more data dictionary functions. Any questions at this point? Tom? Thank you. Please, while I'm going through, please just interrupt uh, by uh, if you have any questions, if there's something that you think that I'm sliding too quick over and which is of interest of you. Because I cannot go into every detail because we don't have time enough. If we have time enough, as Karen said, I can speak to you about also how we model environments in premise. But if we don't have the time, unfortunately, we, we cannot do that today. But there will be uh, places where you can go and see video uh, recorded presentations where you can find it. So please just raise a hand if you have a question. Right. Now we're going into the data dictionary in detail. We have talked a little about the um, entities and we're going a lot more into the semantic units and to the relationships. So semantic units, uh, a semantic unit is a property of an entity. It's, tells, it's telling something about the entity. So it's a, it's, a, uh, it's a piece of information that you may need for your repository that somebody has experienced was needed but others may choose not to have. But it's to carry out your uh, digital preservation functions. There are two kinds of uh, semantic units. It's either a container which contain other semantic units or it's a component with a value. And you have already seen the agent uh, identifier example. <clears throat> so let's look a bit more into, and that's the biggest one, uh, the object. What semantic units are with an object? Uh, what do we want to know about an object? There can be technical information, as we already heard, uh, the fixity. Uh, but we also want to know what kind of object is it um, and it has an identifier and there's a lot of different characteristics uh, that we want to preserve that can also be expressed, uh, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's all things that you can think of that you want to know about your object. The two mandatory things about an object, and that's the only two, uh, that's the identifier, in the same way as we saw uh, for the agent, but also for the object uh, earlier on, uh, and the category. And uh, we've already seen the type and value, but the category we, we just look into. That was the intellectual entity, if you have more representations. It's a representation that can be model for different files uh, and bit streams. So that was what I talked about in the earlier uh, slot of this section. And where you, uh, we, we usually say type, <laughs> even it's called object uh, category in, in the data dictionary, it's the same thing. It's a type of object. And that's also how you express it in the XML example by a C type. So, uh, for files and bit streams, as I said, they are a bit similar because uh, a lot of the characteristics for, for an object in form of a file for bit streams uh, are uh, very much alike. So, for instance, there's a lot of technical uh, uh, properties that you want to, to describe for these. 
Therefore, for files and bit streams, there's another thing that's mandatory, and that's the object characteristics. It's not for representations or intellectual entities, but for these two, they are. <clears throat> we will say we've already talked about this being uh, uh, technology agnostic, uh, both as whether it's expressed in XML or in the ontology, but also in the aspects of what we can actually uh, put down there. Uh, because it's not just for one the formats we know today. It's, it's done flexible, so it can be new things that's coming up that you can actually uh, register. So let's look a bit closer to what these object characteristics are. Um, <clears throat> they, they're technical properties that are common to all I would say all, but you should never, <laughs> you cannot see into the future. <laughs> uh, anyway, it's, it's most uh, file formats. Uh, and of course, we always, when we extend this, think about that it has to be technology agnostic. Um, there's a composition level, which I will come back to because that needs a bit more uh, explanation. Fixity is quite straightforward, uh, uh, and you already seen that example Mickey showed. Size, size of a file, straightforward. Format, either via, via uh, <coughs> uh, uh, for instance, uh, a proof, or where you also uh, point to that, um, or it can be format in any different way that you want to, to uh, specify it. Then there's creating application. That's also quite straightforward. It's actually describing the application that created this object. Uh, inhibitors, that is if you have uh, encrypted uh, your object, then you need to register how you to decrypt it, etc. And then there's the object characteristic extension. So what I will do now is that I will only go into these two, the composition level and the object characteristic extension. So the composition level, uh, that is needed because there can be more levels of actually char characterizing uh, your files. For instance, if you zipped your file, then you have more files within your zip file that also needs characterization in order to do your preservation actions. So if you have a PDF file like here, you ha that will, would have a, a, a composition level O. And then the zipped file will have composition level one. So if you then do another thing, that would be another level. So it starts from the inside and out. I hope this is clear. So you can actually make more chunks of premise that describes the PDF and another chunk describing the SIP. There can be other parts uh, of, uh, there can other be other examples. A very common example is for instance, mail attachments. Um, images within a PDF, etc. So it's needed, we have needed it in several cases. There's many places that needs it. The other one I would talk about was the object characteristic extension. There's a lot of places where you will see these extensions. Uh, so I'm explaining it here and I will refer, refer back to it. This is actually the way that we also uh, getting technology agnostic because we are allowing you to take whatever way you want to describe things that are not in premise. You can do that in an uh, uh, object characteristic uh, extension. For instance, if you have a still image and you want to express a lot of uh, still image uh, specific characteristics, you can do that by using the mix uh, standard, for instance, and you can put the mix into this extension. So this is an example of that, where you have the characteristics, the extension, 
and then the next. And, and Primus is quite good at this in the way that if you actually use XML and not the ontology and stuff like that, the scheme is actually built up so it also validates your inner uh, schemes if you give it a scheme location. Right. So remember, extensions is where you can put any other uh, information in, in any, uh, uh, here it's, it's an XML and then it would have to be XML, but uh, whatever you use, it can be anything that you put in there. Right. So I said all semantic, semantic units that is named something with extension works like this. Okay, then there's more general information about objects. There can be significant properties where you specify whether, for instance, an image that will be the size or, or depth of colors or something like that. You, that should remain if you migrate. Uh, so that can be specified there. I will come back to preservation level, original name, that's just the original name. Uh, storage, that could come back to what Mickey was uh, saying before, uh, but it may be that you don't want to use that. We do not use that because we bit preserve our metadata. We don't just want it to be here now, we want to be sure that in a hundred years time, these metadata is actually uh, accessible so you can understand your object. And then it does not make sense to call, uh, to, uh, to record storage because it's something that's bit preserved and it will change all the time. So that's just an example of you pick what you think is interested for the way that you uh, uh, do in your repository. And then there's uh, signature information if there's a, a password uh, attached to, to a file. So that's also straightforward. But I would like to say a little more, more about preservation level. Uh, the thing about preservation level that's actually the only thing in premise that is talking about the business related uh, metadata. But it, it is uh, in a way to uh, record the, the strategy you have for this object in, in, with your preservation. Um, and there can be varying preservation options uh, depending on the factors uh, such as uh, what's the value of your object, uh, what's the unique, unique, uniqueness <laughs> uh, and preservability of the, of the format. Yeah, so it's, it's a, a business rule for your repository. And we use it a lot. <clears throat> we use it, for instance, for the logical uh, strategy and for the bits uh, preservation uh, strategy as well. So you could have a, a preservation level type called uh, bit safety and you could have a value saying this is high because this is digital born or this is medium because we still have a physical uh, copy that we can uh, uh, re-digitize from. So and that is registered with, with the object. It could also be the logical strategy and it can be a lot of other things. Uh, what you also can record with the preservation level is uh, whether it's an intention or it's required, that's optional. Uh, it can be a rationale, for instance, this is high bit safety because this and that, even though we can digitize it. Uh, and of course, you should have a date for when you make the, this decision because you may change that decision later on, and then you have to record the new decision with a date. Any questions this far? Nope. Okay, you can come back if you, you suddenly pop up with something. 
Yes. Um, now you can see I've, I've jumped over a, a lot of things because they're called something with the environment. And that's the things that I can go through later if we have the time. But for now, we're leaving it there. So for objects, we now go to the uh, linking between entities, uh, or at least where objects are involved. <clears throat> There's uh, two kind of uh, ways to, uh, to uh, specify uh, linking. Uh, it's either through the relationship or these two linking event identifier and linking right statement uh, identifier. If we look at this overview, actually what you can see is that, uh, yeah, I'll first need to say, we, we don't take the one in the middle because that's to do with environments. Uh, and then we have the relationship, that is when an object relates to itself for some reason. You will get examples in a minute, but there are cases where we need to do that. And then we have the identifiers when you point to the other entities. And you will see the same naming convention for all of the entities. So for the object, you have the uh, linking going from the object to the right, which is called linking right statement identifier. And we have the uh, one going from the object to the event called linking event identifier. So, uh, for these uh, linking, you have a type of an identifier and you have the value, just as you specify an identifier for an object or agent, etc. Uh, and it's the same if you follow the naming convention, you can see where it belongs actually. Uh, there are some exceptions because they're all on this form, but there are uh, some exceptions because sometimes you want to specify some extra information, like a role uh, for, for an event. But otherwise, they're very much the same. Okay. So, let's look a bit closer on the more difficult one, and I promise you, it's not that difficult as long as we're not talking environments then it becomes difficult. But here, it's not that bad. Um, <clears throat> we have these different types of objects. But we also know that they can relate, like we saw in the example of the digitized page. You should actually be able to say, this digitized page is actually part of this representation, etc. So that's why we have these object-to-object -object relations. You can always have a relation from a bitstream to a bitstream or a file to a file. That's allowed. Uh, that would be is part of, for instance. Uh, you can also say that for, for these that are shown here, so for bitstream to representation, bitstream to file, it's uh, you can have a relationship saying is included in. And when you, we go up to the intellectual entity, it can be represents. Uh, if you go into the uh, data dictionary, you will see another uh, image of this, uh, these relations. Uh, and I just thought that this way was a better way to present it but it's doing exactly the same. It's exactly the same, just in another form. Right. <clears throat> so, what is the semantic unit for this relationship? What we have is that we have a type, we have a subtype, and we have an identifier. And the rest of them are blurred out because that's to do with environments. So, for instance, if you want to say that uh, a representation represents an intellectual entity, you say from, from this representation object, you make a relation saying, I'm a type structured, structural, and I represent this 
object, which is then the intellectual entity. So that's how it works. Is that clear? Okay. Um, so, uh, there is also this related uh, event identifier. And that was, we had it, uh, we talked a bit about it uh, in the earlier, uh, the morning session. <clears throat> what about migration? And uh, if you have a migration, you need, I'm me, but I need to point to, uh, to say, I'm migrated from this one, for instance. <clears throat> so I point, I'm me, I'm migrated from this object, and that's the relation that I'm specifying, but I'm pointing to the event that actually did this. Um, so if, if you only have one object uh, associated with an event, you would use the other one, uh, the linking event identifier from your object, because then you're only pointing to the event. But in the case of migration, you point to the other object, and to the event by this one. Okay, and then it was the environments. Right. Any questions, anything that you want to know more about, about objects, please, because otherwise I will go to events now. This was the hard part, so it's okay to have questions. Okay. I hope I did a good job, that's why. <laughs> okay, events. <clears throat> For events, uh, there we again have the identifier and the type as mandatory. But we have another uh, mandatory field and that's the date uh, and time because we need to know when the, this event was, otherwise it, it doesn't make sense to record the event. The rest is optional. <clears throat> and an event must be related to one or more objects or can be related to one or more uh, agents. It's the same pattern with the identifier, type and value, but even type I will come back to. The date and time, straightforward, uh, and I will come back to the detail information and the outcome information. The linking agent identifier and linking object of, uh, identifier, you just heard about that. That was these pointing to the other entities. So <clears throat> the event type, that can be ingestion, validation, creation, compression, anything where you think this is uh, worth uh, recording about this object. There is a controlled vocabulary uh, on id.log.gov, uh, and it's, it's really a lot there. Uh, it's up to you whether you want to use it. It's not mandatory to use it. Uh, it's also up to you to what granularity you want to record these events. And actually, it can also be that what you want to record is not in this vocabulary. And then I would say, what we do in that case, we have found cases, what we do is that we uh, find out what we recall it, and then we document it uh, uh, in a special place where we have all the information about our preservation and document what does this mean. Right. So that was the event type. Going to the event detail information and outcome information. Oh, why didn't I do that? That is because when you go into them, they're just extensions. So what you can do there is that if you have extra detailed information about this event that you want to uh, put in there, you can use this uh, event detail information and use the extension here and then put it in. And the same if there has been an outcome, for instance, if you run JHO, a characterization, 
and you want the outcome to be represented there, that could be the same thing, that you use the extension on the event uh, outcome information and put it in there. So that was the event. Any questions? Right. Then we have the agent. As you already heard, oh, that was not it. The only mandatory semantic unit here is actually the identifier. And that's also because you can have described it anywhere else and then you can point to it. So uh, you could also, you don't need to specify the premise actually to point to it. But it can also be that you only want to have only the identifier. What is else there? There's a name, that's straightforward. You can put a name for the agent. Agent type, we've seen that, but we see that again. Agent version, it may be that it's a specific version. That's also straightforward. Agent note, you can put an extra note. Agent extension, again, possibility to come extra uh, information in, in another format. Uh, and then you have the uh, linking event identifier and right, uh, linking uh, right statement identifier. That was what you saw in this big one where they were related. And then we have an extra one, which is linking environment, which has to do with environments. So we don't go into that. But <coughs> uh, then I got to talk too soon. <laughs> um, it may hold an, or grant one or more rights. Of course, it uh, may carry out or uh, be related to an event, or it may uh, create or act upon more, uh, one or more objects through an event with respect to the right statement. Then there was the agent type. Again, there is a vocab vocabulary uh, on id.log.gov which you can use, but in this case, it's, it's more common that we say use these values. <laughs> uh, but you could uh, also use others, I think, yeah. Uh, and as said before, it can be hardware, it can be an organization, it can be soft, uh, software, and it can be a person. And uh, you may wonder why it can be hardware, but that's actually because it, it, it also to do with environments, then you will need to have agents that are hardware as well. So that was what there were about agents. Any questions here? Okay. Then I will go to the right. <coughs> There are two ways of specifying rights. And let me say, please go and see the paper about rights because I'm presenting the version I know. It's not with the, the things that are going on right now, which may come into a new, newer version of it. Uh, so it's how premise is looking now that I'm presenting now. And what you can do is that you can specify your rights in two ways either by a right statement, which I will go through in a minute, or with a rights extension, where you put in whatever format uh, you want to specify your rights in. Uh, and the way, it, if you want to do it by right statement, uh, there's a lot of, uh, uh, there's a few uh, semantic units here. It's worse than it seems. There's of course the identifier, and then you have the right spaces, which actually point to what kind of rights am I talking about. So the right spaces is either copyright, license, statute, or other, and you would fill in the other uh, semantic units that are uh, uh, like that. Um, if you have a copyright, it will be copyright information, etc. So, uh, if you have both copyright and license and statute, you should actually repeat this, uh, the right chunk. 
uh, it should only be what is in the right basis for each of them. So here's a small example. Uh, and we can go back here and see there's also something about right squandered, which I may see something about. And then again, you have the linking object identifier and the linking agent identifier, as we talked about before. Rights granted, that's of course what action is allowed, under what condition, and are there time constraints, and so forth. Uh, and it contains these various uh, things that we can specify. I don't want to go too deeply into it, but it is a scheme for how you can actually specify your rights if you don't want the other one where you choose your own scheme. So, completed. That was premise data dictionary data model. Any questions? Okay. Can you see how you could use some of this in in your cases? Some nodding. Okay. We can also come back to it. If you have questions later on, please just take them up. Which bring us to Karen. We try to do a wrap up. I think <laughs> we are rather early even if we could try to take this slowly. Should, should I take the, the environment? Are we too early or what? We have about four to five minutes left. Okay. Do you want to hear about the environments? Yes? Nodding? Yes? Okay, then I think I'll take the environments. Is that okay with you? Yep. Okay. So environments has been introduced in premise version three and the, it was hard work getting to this. But that was because the community said, we need something, we need to model something, uh, especially with complex objects, so we can actually uh, specify with our preservation metadata uh, the environments that these objects should actually be uh, uh, emulated in, in the future. So this is a reason for this, uh, and it is a bit complex because it, it's not easy. It is a complex task, uh, but we have uh, tried to do it uh, as simple as possible. Uh, you could say, why well, don't have environment as its own entity, and we actually tried that, and that did not work well because an environment is an object in itself because you also have to get metadata about this uh, environment. Therefore, we see it as an object can also be an environment, not as type, but as something you describe and then use as an environment. <clears throat> so, environments is to register what is needed uh, to render this content object. And that can be uh, operating system, it can be application software needed, it can be the hardware uh, or computing resources. Uh, for instance, an old Word file, maybe a, a certain Windows version and uh, uh, certainly Word, the Word application with that version, uh, etc. And when we talk uh, computer game, it can certainly also be hardware uh, there are computer games that are on specific uh, consoles, uh, etc. Okay, so if we take an example, we have a file 
uh, content object, like the word file I'm talking about. Um, and we have an intellectual entity for, for this uh, uh, content object. Where the relationship is, as I showed earlier, it's structural represents. Uh, then there can be other relations, and that's the, where the relation is uh, uh, related to environments. That is uh, of type requires. This word file requires, uh, and uh, uh, it's a type dependency and subtype requires, and that's how you say, I require this hardware. I require this operating system. I require this software application. Where the hardware, the operating system, and the uh, software application are modeled as objects in themselves. Okay. For instance here, it could be a ISO file image which had this uh, operating system. Uh, uh, etc. So you can have it on all levels. Okay. Then we saw this linking environment identifier on the agent. Uh, that's because an agent is actually, it can be an environment acting as an agent. Um, for instance, a format migration software uh, involved in a preservation action. Uh, that is an agent. So the, the, the relationship points to the environment uh, acting, uh, environment object acting as an agent. We also saw on the object this environment function, environment uh, designation, registry, and extension. And there was something about the relationship there as well. The function can be, for instance, that it's a software or it's an operating system, uh, etc. Uh, the designation can be name, version, origin. And that's, a, that's the way the object is described as an environment. You have these extra information as well. It can also uh, point to a registry with, with, with different uh, environment parts. Um, and of course you have the extension again. So if there's any information that is not presented here, you can use the extension to have these information as well. And you already saw from the example that the relationship type could be dependency required. Now, object to object relations, that's here it's getting a bit complex and I see that uh, I hope we get through because it looks a bit odd with these. Maybe it changed. We're trying. Okay, an object can be an object, a file, that's object A. And then another object is the environment for object A. Uh, an environment can point to an environment, and an environment can point to an object, and vice versa. Um, for instance, we see this first error. That's object to environment, uh, specifying a computa computational context. So this object should be uh, uh, shown using this con uh, environment. And then there's environment to object. That could be, for instance, if you have an object with documentation of the environment then that doc documentation can uh, point to, to the environment, or the environment can point to the documentation of it, sorry. Uh, and the third one, sorry, there's something with the animations here. The third one is uh, from environment to environment, and that could be inclusion or dependencies, or <clears throat> for instance, this operating system should be on this hardware or whatever. Additional environment information um, 
there are different environments that can be uh, uh, support. Uh, they can support different uh, purposes. So you have a, a possibility to spe specify that as well when it's create when it's supporting creation uh, or edit or rendering. And uh, there's also one uh, where you can put characteristics in. So it could be, uh, this is the minimum environment that you need in order to render this file. Uh, or that we know that it works if you run it in this. We don't know anymore. So you can put that kind of information in. And that's what you see here. So we have the type, subtype, object identifier as we saw before, and then you have the purpose, create, edit, modify, render, and the uh, characteristics, as I just spoke about. There is a control vocabulary, again, on id.log.gov for, for the purpose. And again, you're free to use that or, or come with more and document it yourself. Yes. This is, don't, don't, <laughs> we're not going. <laughs> it was just because there was extra slides, so it was put in the end. So I'm going back. Is there any questions? I know it is a bit complex, and, uh, but it, it helps if you sit down and work with it and say, what, what is my use case for using environments? Uh, then it gets a bit uh, easier because it's not, uh, yeah. Uh, could you explain, perhaps for me, maybe I, I didn't understand at least, uh, about why do you need an agent on top of the environment? So what is exactly the relationship between the environment when you have an object that is an environment that you need? Why do you also need an agent to it? What is the role of the agent in that case? I think it's, it's the agent being an environment in itself. Uh, where are we? Yeah. So the agent is actually uh, an environment acting as an agent. And, and the example is a uh, uh, format migration software agent uh, is involved in a preservation action. I, I would like to come back to that because I'm, I'm getting a bit tired, <laughs> so I'm not sure I can explain it. Uh, uh, more than that, uh, I remember the discussions. Um, so I would very much, and that can come out on the pick list, uh, where it's more detailed uh, uh, described. But, but it is a situation where you actually have that the environment acts as an agent on an object. Uh, and I can't, I don't think this use case is, is, uh, is good enough. Uh, yeah, Mickey? Coming back to the digital art example, that serves as, as a good example for that. You need a very complex thing that you have to set up to render the art piece, right? You need like different hardware, different screens, different software possibly. And in that case, the event would be view or put on display somewhere. And that would have to be done by an agent. And in that case, the agent is the complex environment that contains all the descriptors of hardware and software setups. Um, yeah, I mean, pretty much what, what Mickey just said. I was you know, going to give an example from the work we did um, with video games. And we needed to use agents 
to exactly um, um, describe some of that complexity because an agent could be, let's say, the original platform and then the, emulate, the emulation software, the emulated environment. And then we needed different environments because we could render video games in different settings. The thing is that there was always the original environment, which was, let's say, the video game console. And that we would describe with technical metadata and would have all the kind of, uh, you know, what did we call it? Totem, right? That was, that's what it was called, uh, which was the kind of technical specification metadata. Um, but then, beyond that original environment, we realized that we could create additional environments where that game would render. The problem was, once we had all these different environments, what did they relate to? Because some of these environments related to specific emulators, some of them um, related to specific institutions and the way that they wanted to emulate it or you know, allow and so on. And that's where the, the agent part came in handy because we could associate which agent, whether software or hardware configuration or institution, relates to that particular environment as opposed to having all these different environments out in the wild and not understanding afterwards, you know, for posterity, how would you know why that environment was relevant or in what context? And thank you for that. Yeah, especially emulation. That, that is a very, very good example and I will, I will correct the slide for next time. <laughs> Oh, okay. <laughs> right. So, oh, well, there were other questions. Sorry. Um, I'm really interested to find out more about the example from Glasgow because uh, that seems like a particularly complex part of premise, and it'd be very nice to see some worked examples. So if, if you're able to make available a link to the work that you've done with computer games, that'd be fantastic. That's old work. That's, uh, I'll nothing, I'll nothing wrong with old school. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll, I'll and, and we will be very happy to actually, that is also, if we can make it public, so, because there are different uh, examples of using uh, premise uh, uh, on the, the premise side. So that could be very good to have there as well. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I have a question for the gentleman about the technical metadata and the environment. So I think that that's some kind of overlapping between two. How, when do you use technical metadata and when do you use, you know, environment factor in your premise? I think technical metadata is usually to characterize an object, where environment would be more, what environment do I need to actually uh, render or whatever the purpose is of this object? So in that way, the environment is outside in order to do something with the object while technical metadata is about the object, its characteristics about the object. Thank you. Other questions? Then I will try and go back. Yes. Do you want to take over, Karen? Uh, no, you can keep talking. <laughs> it's perfectly okay. <laughs> so I will try to wrap up today. A little of, of the things I'm going to talk about. We have just seen the data dictionary. Um, 
it's not, as Eld said, it's not something you read in a coffee break. It takes some time. And actually, we talked about mapping uh, before the break. That is actually a good example of, I have this object. Okay, I have this information. I know I have its ID. Yeah, well, I end up, oh, that's mandatory. Good that I already have it. And I actually know what type it is. So going through the data dictionary is not something you sit and read. You actually look around in it. Uh, there are, of course, other parts of the data dictionary. So you have it in two versions online. You have a full, the full data dictionary with all the extra text, and you have just the data dictionary, all the semantic units that Elle has been talking about. So you have more text in it to read and to get information. Especially then, websites, email, uh, email, it has been updated from the last time we actually um, put out a new version. So use the one in the slides and not the one in the d data dictionary. As I said, we have a home page. Uh, we are hosted by the Library of Congress. So you find the whole web page there, but also as you saw before, we do have some more places, places where we are hanging around. So Zenodo being one example, Copter, and we are working with setting up a wiki where I think what you talked about, Leo, will end up in the wiki page. And we have the pig. And so by no means you are fully fully knowing everything about premise right now. You have I gotten an insight. Yeah, I see some people shaking their heads and the other ones are nodding. Yes, that's the, really how you look after having three hours of premise. Uh, I've been working with pre premise since 2007. I'm still d doing those phases sometime. <laughs> so it's really, it's a life, long journey and the digital things that are happening do affect as you heard we are working with, with updates that means premise will be updated and you have a start now you have you have gotten the hints on where to read and as i said don't read it from page one to the last page you need to skip some parts and look at what you currently are needing. Uh, we do have a short, I'm not sure it's short when it's 25 pages, but uh, we have the understanding premise text that is uh, even translated into different languages. Um, English is the master version. We do have premise in METS guidelines. We have mentioned METS a number of times already. So as you know, METS is the metadata encoding and transmission standard, standard, which has a part regarding administrative metadata where you can place the premise metadata. Uh, of course, we have already also mentioned that some things are actually present in other standards. So in this guideline, you actually get guides on how to think about when you have identifiers in the MEDS document and, then, and then identifiers in the premise information and so on. So that's a good thing to look at. It has been created in um, cooperation between the premise editorial committee and the METS uh, editorial board. We have the conformance statement that Mickey talked about. Have that in mind when you're thinking about this, especially when we come to the terms. I've heard really exciting definitions of representations the last couple of weeks. Uh, when you conform to premise, you use the premise way of describing the representation, not something else. So 
and there are some examples of implementation also available. What we are currently doing is that we are moving the data dictionary from being a Word document into a TAFE format to make it easier to maintain and also make it possible to transform to other publication versions. It takes its time, but it's starting to look decent, I would say. Uh, we will update the data dictionary following the work that has happened with the ontology. Small things that we see that needs clarification, not really big changes, but more explanations is needed and so on. We will enhance our use of Zenodo. We are setting up, up a new wiki, as I said, and we have started with uh, looking into our notes from our meetings. We have no meeting notes from 2006, so that's how long we have meet a meeting history, just so you know. So it, it takes some time to, come, to put everything up. And we do have the rights overhaul, which is a Thursday, Mario Lane. Yeah, Thursday, you will get an insight in what's happening with rights. It's not, nothing revolu revolutionary, it's just enhancing so we actually can do the, use the rights as has been described today for rights not being the same the whole time. A couple of years ago, there was a book published. It's still available. It's still relevant because it's not deep, diving deep. It's giving the oversights and understanding implementing premise. Uh, you have examples from the library world, the archival world, the other world. And Mickey, yeah, I'm, think, I'm thinking like you, I wonder what does other always are. But yeah, so that's available. We do have some exercises. Um, I know you are kind of tired. That means I'm not going to force you to do exercises now. Uh, and I'm not even going to, going to have, I had a, we got a class at work a long time ago about how you should get your audience engaged. And one of them was, have everybody stand up and rub their backs towards each other. Oh, I'm not going to ask you to do that. But these exercises gives a way of looking into the mapping, looking at a few uh, of the uh, semantic units. So print them out. Don't print out the solution the first thing. <laughs> it's in the same place, I know, but still. And look, into, look at those examples and actually take them as starting to look into the data dictionary to understand the L, uh, semantic units, trying to figure out the information you have. There is this aiding document to these exercises. And that's actually what both Elle and Mickey has been talking about. The first part of describing each of the entities in premise. So you have the list with the mandatory, repeatable, and so on. That is actually has been cut out to its own document. So that's the sh really cheeky way of doing premise. So the first exercise that you will find, and these are placed on Zenodo already, is about the object entity. And as El said, that's the tricky part. That's the exercise with the most pages. And that's the exercise that takes the longest time. Uh, what you do is that on the page one, you have a description and you have some images and you have to categorize your objects. And when you have done that, you can start to fill in the premise information you have. And use that cheeky sheet from the previous slide. So when you look at the, at the exercise, this, this is the total exercise. And yeah, it's many, a lot of pages following this one, but you have the information about your objects. Read the text. The text gives you the clues. 
And then each exercise looks like this. You have information about the book. Did we hear an intellectual entity somewhere? Uh, we have the local identifier. We have identifier for the OCR file. So the ones marked with a star is the mandatory things. So go through them, sit there, take more than a coffee break, look at them, put them away, go back to them, read some in the data dictionary. Um, I'm not going to show that one. That was the replies, but you have that already. Same for the events, aliens, and rights. And here you see the difference in having, uh, look, compared to and taking into account what Ellen said, the objects is the long and tricky part. When you have conquered that one, the rest is easy. Um, same here, available on Synodo. Don't print the answers the first thing you do. That's the whole exercise. It's the same here, fill in a table for the event, for the rights. And as I said, you have some answers. And then we have the tricky one, which, be, which is the environments. But as Elle said, sitting there and looking at it and taking, really let it take time and some more time, and some more time, then you will actually start seeing it fall, to, fall into and become that solved puzzle that you want to have. I'm also stealing this ones from you, Eld, and reusing an example to look at. Uh, so you have all the links to this example being a postcard with all this met metadata and also a, a uh, connected with a paper regarding this. So some extra reading for another coffee break or two, we'll see. Questions in parking, I don't think we really have any questions in parking. So if we ask go to questions, everybody needs lunch or uh, a lot of coffee breaks for being ready to conquer premise? <laughs> At least get people to giggle. I, I just want to say, because it is a big mouthful, but it, it's, it's, don't start with environments. And some of you do not need environments. Some of you do, but some of you don't. You don't need to understand everything here. And, and the, the most important thing is to start by thinking about what preservation data, data do I actually need in order to help uh, fu the future to understand what I've done a lot of work to actually preserve. So uh, it is, when you get to work with it, it's not that bad. Uh, and certainly don't, don't start uh, to drive hard. Digital preservation is hard, uh, but the, the most important thing is that we, we get started. And, uh, so we do have one question that came in through Slido, um, which says, is there a date field to record when the environment was last tested? Um, I, the, I don't think there's a, a direct date field, but you can al always use the extension part to put that in. I, I would actually say that, we, and here you can hear, we are already having, I mean, I'm going to add a third implementation here. I would actually do that as an event because I want to have events that record that my, I have tested my environment and that it works. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Yep. Also because you don't want metadata to change too much, especially if you're not bit preserving them as we do. So um, yeah, you're absolutely right. And that's, so, that's one of the good things with premise. We can do it in these different ways, even if everybody now so sounded like they will do it my way. Yes. <laughs> but you can do it as you want. You can go as deep as you want. 
when it comes to recording things, just taking the higher level events, or you can go down to the lowest level of an event and re really have elaborate event descriptions. But you need to find out what you are doing, what do you want the future to know, and I think it's actually more than we think that the future needs to know. But you need to sit there, discuss it with yourselves. Uh, hopefully you have at least one colleague to discuss it with. And use the pig list if you want to have other people's views. I actually think this was a very good example because it is very good to talk with somebody about how you want to model it because uh, there are so many possibilities and this was an example of, oh, yes, you, maybe you could do it this way. And no, you could also do it this way. And then consider what is best for, for your situation. That's very important. So, as I said, uh, not in any, any ways a full university class or knowing premise for a, doing it for a whole term. It's a lifelong... Um, engagement. Um, so this has been the introduction for you to premise. Use the resources that are available, participate in the discussions, and start, uh, and when you do have a question, use the pig list. We from the editorial committee also replies to the pig list, and we send questions to the pig list when we have them. So you use it, even if I know that Email lists aren't maybe the most used things anymore, but since we are so spread around the world, how do we otherwise connect? Yes, we can meet at iPress once a year, but in the meantime, use the pig. <laughs> so, we are a community standard. You affect or give examples and ask us what we need to change and update. We need examples. Leo is now big up for giving us one. He didn't know what he did when he signed up for taking care of this tutorial. Send the questions, send suggestions, and take part, because that's the only way we can make it evolve, is if everybody actually takes part. Thank you. <laughs>